faced with barbarians at his doorstep, usurpers on the frontiers, and rebellious subjects in Rome itself, the third century emperor Aurelian turns to the soldier's own god for help and manages to restore and unite the broken empire. But before his work can take root, he is assassinated, leaving the empire at risk once again. Now, in the troubled days of the late Roman Empire, many rulers vie for power. From this chaos, one man emerges, eliminating his rivals and uniting the empire under the sign of a new god. His name is Constantine, and he will stop at nothing to save a dying empire. century Rome is racked by internal strife and barbarian invasions. But by 295 AD, a powerful new emperor has emerged as the empire's savior. His name is Diocletian. What Diocletian has chosen to do uh, addresses a number of the concerns and a number of the challenges the empire faced in the third century. One element that Diocletian brings in is a redefinition of the way frontiers were to be defended. Emperor Diocletian creates a mobile imperial army, always available to send reinforcements to the vulnerable frontier. One of his most capable imperial soldiers is Constantine, only 17 years old. He was a distinguished soldier. That is to say that he was very courageous in battle and that he performed all sorts of feats of daring do. These early signs of greatness in Constantine have not escaped the notice of Emperor Diocletian. Diocletian keeps the young soldier close at hand, claiming a desire to groom Constantine for a position of power within the empire. Diocletian's other major reform is to divide the empire between four co-emperors, one each in Illyricum and Italy. While Constantine's father rules from Gaul, Diocletian himself governs from Nicomedia in Asia Minor. But Diocletian knows how easily his chosen co-emperors could turn on him. To prevent this, he keeps their sons, including Constantine, in his court, where they are trained as master soldiers under his watchful eye. Constantine was sent off to the court of Diocletian to obtain the proper education for uh, a member of the upper class, a literary education, philosophical education. He learned Greek, which he wouldn't have known, but most important, he had a military education. But Constantine's life in court is anything but comfortable, for as a father figure and an emperor, Diocletian rules with an iron fist. He begins to rule increasingly by issuing a whole series of extremely heavily moralizing edicts, telling people what to do, telling them how to be better citizens, and so forth. Diocletian insists that everyone at court, including Constantine, make regular sacrifices. For above all, Diocletian believes unity in the empire comes from appeasing Rome's pagan gods. But another religion is gathering many converts, putting Diocletian's plans at risk. Its followers worship the son of a new god, Jesus Christ. The church had not only grown numerically, but it had also grown quite wealthy. It had come to control large buildings. It was, in many ways, a thriving institution within the Roman Empire. An institution that Diocletian believes is a threat to Rome. He was extremely concerned that the health of the state and the health of Rome itself was tied up with Roman religion and Christians were a threat to that. 
Christians who had been tolerated for nearly 40 years were clearly a large percentage of the population in the big cities. And it's clear that there were Christians in the army and there were Christians in the imperial court. Diocletian begins in his own imperial army, where he requires that all soldiers make sacrifices to the gods of Rome, though many Christians refuse. Diocletian believed that anything that interfered with the cultivation of Rome's protecting gods was a genuine threat to, to the state and could destroy the state, could destroy the state from within. This is the way he looked upon Christians in the army. Punishment for rejecting the emperor's edict is death a brutality that Constantine, as a soldier in Diocletian's army, is forced to witness. Constantine grows troubled by the fear and discord born of Diocletian's reforms. It is a discord that will soon spread beyond the army. In 303 AD, Emperor Diocletian issues an edict against all Christians that becomes known as the Great Persecution. As soon as the persecution edict was issued, it unleashed what is virtually a culture of administrative cruelty. Roman officials, in carrying out the edict, when they met resistance, were expected to bring the defendants to court and to torture them for evidence and try to force them to officially and publicly give up their Christianity. The Great Persecution marks the beginning of what the Christians call the Era of Martyrs. Any Christian who proclaims his faith in public is subject to death. In many ways, Diocletian's persecution brought previous persecutions way farther. It's probably the closest Roman emperors came to destroy the entire system. That is probably why so many martyrs um, commemorated by the Christian church are said to have uh, suffered um, for Christ during the Diocletian's reign. Despite his reservations about the persecutions, Constantine must stay on good terms with the man who will likely determine his future. But when Diocletian unexpectedly falls ill and is forced to retire, Constantine is surprised to find himself shut out of the succession plan. Diocletian, it seems, understood that Constantine represented something of a threat. Constantine had campaigned with Diocletian and had done a reasonably good job during these campaigns. We're told that later in his life, Diocletian actually had imprisoned Constantine in his court to prevent Constantine from going to his father's court and establishing a relationship with his father's army. But now, with nothing left to keep him in the East, Constantine resolves to grab hold of his destiny and finally escape Diocletian's grasp. Constantine travels from Nicomedia to Boulogne, Gaul, to meet his father, who now rules Spain, Gaul, and Britain. Constantine's father, Emperor Constantius, is by now old, unwell, and troubled by the extended absence of a son he longs for. But in 305 AD, Constantine is finally united with his father, a man more like him in nature than Diocletian ever was. Constantius, as far as we can tell in the West, was a good deal more relaxed in his approach to government, and he certainly found that it was quite possible to ignore some of the things that Diocletian told him to do. Constantine finds in his father a more compassionate leader and Constantius finds his son has grown into the kind of man who could one day take his place on the throne. When Emperor Diocletian retires in 305 AD, Constantine is finally released from his controlling grip and free to join his aging father Constantius in the West. 
One of Rome's four co-emperors, Constantius rules over Spain, Gaul, and Britain, now threatened by barbarian Picts. In 305 AD, he and Constantine travel from Boulogne to Britain to put down the rebellion. The Picts are a ferocious tribe in present-day Scotland that has long plagued Roman Britain. In battle, these bloodthirsty barbarians present a serious challenge for Constantine and his father. These barbarian neighbors in the fourth century are much better organized than they had been in previous generations. The Roman armies faced far more difficult campaigns in Europe than they previously had. To make matters worse, Emperor Constantius's health is in serious decline. The ailing emperor, he clearly was sick by the time he had come with his son to face the danger of the, of the Picti, had gone on to this campaign. is yet another indication of how serious the threat was. With Constantius's health in question, it is up to Constantine to lead his father's troops and secure their allegiance in battle. When Constantine rejoined his father in the west, Constantius made sure that he began to assume a place in the higher command echelons, that he joined the army on campaign, that the soldiers came to know him, and that he would actually have a natural place within the administration of the Western Empire. This had always been Constantius's hope for him. With his military prowess, Constantine wins the loyalty of the army. But the victory cannot save his father's life. In the end, Constantine will lose the father he has only just come to know. When his father died, the army thought enough of Constantine that they immediately acclaimed him emperor. In a way, this is a natural occurrence. It was an army that knew Constantine's father, respected Constantine's father, and now knew the son as well. They understood, in a sense, what they were getting with Constantine. In an empire where the death of a ruler too frequently leads to violent coups and ambitious plays for power, Constantine's succession is smooth and bloodless. But when barbarian Franks attack Gaul in 306 AD, Constantine faces his first challenge as emperor. He heads south from Britain to meet them in battle. Franks clearly understood the death of Constantius was an opportunity, and an opportunity that they could take advantage of. Constantine, though, demonstrated a great capacity as a commander and beat back this initial incursion. As a new emperor, Constantine wastes no time proving his worth. The emperor was expected to be in personal command of the army and was very often expected to be in command in the front rank. Constantine seems himself to have been a very capable frontline soldier. He's often seen to be leading cavalry charges in his battle. He's a very able tactician. He is also wise and knows that to establish his power, he must win the trust of the populace as well. The captured Frankish leaders provide the perfect opportunity to do just that. Constantine parades the barbarian captives in the streets of Trier in modern-day Germany to show his people he will protect them. 
Constantine's well aware that the primary objective of any emperor at this point, if he wants to gain and hold power, is to fight with barbarians. So Constantine does this in grand fashion. Constantine undertakes campaigns against the Franks, and we have evidence that he captured a couple of Frankish kings whom he then put on display in the arena for the delight of the Gallic masses. Ultimately, the barbarians will be thrown to the beasts, sending a clear message that Constantine will not tolerate those who threaten the Roman Empire. But in 306 AD, the empire is threatened from within when a usurper named Maxentius seizes power in Rome, declaring himself emperor and taking control of most of Italy and North Africa. The usurper Maxentius wins support by promising to cut taxes and provide free grain to the people of Rome. Like Constantine, he is the son of a former co-emperor. Constantine was proclaimed emperor by the troops in July of 306, and Maxentius is sitting in Rome is thinking, well, he's emperor, I want to be emperor too. And so what happens is at the end of 306, he's proclaimed emperor. But unlike Constantine's, Maxentius's claim to the throne is not legitimate. Maxentius defeats, imprisons, and eventually murders the rightful co-emperor of Italy. And soon, the people of Rome will learn his promises are nothing but lies. In 311 AD, the Romans revolt when the free grain and tax cuts are only offered to the wealthy. Ordinary citizens must steal what they can to survive. Maxentius is not a popular leader. He was a particularly ruthless leader. He put down revolts very bloodily. There were rumors going around that he was seducing senators' daughters. There were problems with grain supply. He was taxing people, which they'd never been taxed before in Italy. The desperate uprising of Rome's oppressed masses offers an unexpected opportunity for Constantine. Hoping to save the people of Rome and expand his own reach into Italy, Constantine travels from Gaul to Milan to strike a deal with another co-emperor, Licinius. It is a deal to consolidate power. To seal their alliance, Licinius is betrothed to Constantine's sister. Constantine played every game in the book. He was an extremely ambitious person, and there was no avenue to power that he was going to leave open. That meant that in his early years, he was willing to do all sorts of manipulations to try to continue to climb the ladder. Together, Licinius and Constantine trick their co-emperors in the East into believing their intentions are only to oust Maxentius. Constantine looks to take advantage of the situation uh, and starts calling Maxentius an illegitimate emperor and a usurper. Constantine and his supporters justify an invasion against Maxentius as a necessary removal of a tyrant from the city of Rome. But once Rome is secure, Constantine and Licinius will set their sights on seizing control of the entire empire. In 306 AD, when the usurper Maxentius seizes power in Rome, Constantine strikes an alliance with his equally ambitious co-emperor Licinius to destroy Maxentius and divide the empire between them. While Licinius is occupied with defending the empire's northern border from barbarian invaders, Constantine marches on Rome, laying siege to the imperial city where Maxentius hides.
Within the walls of Rome, the devout pagan Maxentius will base his strategy on the sheep entrails, read by his priest. When it came time to fight a battle, Maxentius was interested in having some sort of divine protection. And he followed the procedures that any good Roman emperor would have followed in order to seek that protection. But desperate to determine if he should wake Constantine out or face him in battle, Maxentius also seeks guidance from the words of the Sibylline prophecies. One of the sources that Maxentius turned to were the Sibylline oracles. These were books of prophecies that were kept by Roman priestly colleges, and these priests would then investigate certain questions and pull out an oracle. This is an oracle in which he's told that an enemy of Rome will die today. For this reason, it seems Maxentius changes his plan and makes a decision that he won't wait Constantine out. He'll go out and meet Constantine in battle. Assuming that Constantine is the enemy of Rome referred to by the oracle, Maxentius prepares his army for war. <laughs> Meanwhile, just outside of Rome, Constantine prepares to meet Maxentius on the battlefield. Knowing his troops will be severely outnumbered, Constantine grows uneasy. Constantine began to get very concerned about the strength of his forces. And we're told he prayed that some god would help him uh, and received a vision in response. And this is interpreted by Constantine as a Christian vision. The fourth century historian Eusebius of Caesarea records what is supposed to have happened as recounted to him by Constantine himself. Around noontime, when the day was already beginning to decline, he saw before him in the sky the sign of a cross of light. He said it was above the sun, and it bore the inscription, Conquer by this. What he claims to have seen was a symbol that looked like a cross with a sort of P form at the top of it, that is the letters Chi Rho, that would have formed the first two letters of Christ's name in Greek. And there are some sources that claim that he also heard a voice at the same time that said that he would conquer by this sign. Constantine orders his soldiers to place the Cairo on their shields and standards, transforming the Christian symbol from an object of persecution to one of honor. Constantine assumed a new god or a god that had formerly been rejected as his divine force, as his um, victory power. By taking on the Christian god, the god that had been subjected to persecution by former emperors, Constantine was therefore doing something quite revolutionary. With his conversion, Constantine turns his impending battle with the pagan Maxentius into a test of religions. Constantine meets Maxentius at the Milvium Bridge, which, passing over the Tiber River, is the only obstacle between Constantine and an open road to Rome. Though grossly outnumbered by Maxentius, Constantine and his army, now marked by the Christian Cairo, ride into battle with courage. The Battle of Milvian Bridge is a significant battle. Uh, the forces are arrayed against each other. And despite a numerical advantage, Maxentius's forces are pushed back by Constantine towards the river. It is at the banks of the Tiber that Maxentius's fate is sealed. Constantine forced Maxentius to give battled with the Tiber at his back. It's a terrible position to be in, and as Constantine's force pressed in on his own, Maxentius's army fell apart. With no other options, the usurper Maxentius flees with his army, attempting to swim across the Tiber River to Rome. But Maxentius, with his heavy armor weighing him down, does not survive the swim. 
Days later, his bloated and deformed body is pulled from the Tiber, final proof that the usurper's regime has fallen. Constantine has won a significant victory at Milvian Bridge that eliminates the opposition of Maxentius and even more significantly gives Constantine control of a full half of the empire, including the wealthy province of Italy. Maxentius's fate is a powerful reminder of Constantine's strength and of what befalls those who dare to oppose him. Constantine went out of his way to dredge his body out just so they could parade his head through Rome and then send it to North Africa to demonstrate that this previous emperor was dead and Constantine had now taken over. His victory over Maxentius also proves to Constantine that the Christian God is more powerful than the pagan gods of his enemy. With the defeat of Maxentius, all of the Western Empire belongs to Constantine. As agreed, he leaves the East for Licinius to take. They meet in Milan, where Constantine and Licinius confirm their mutual support through marriage as planned. Constantine decides to bind himself to Licinius or bind Licinius to his cause. He takes one of his half-sisters, Constantia, and marries her to Licinius, who recognizes that this is the natural way of making an alliance. Now, to begin with, the marriage itself um, actually marks the point at which the two, Constantine on one hand and Licinius on the other, agreed on the policies. One of these policies reflects Constantine's recent adoption of Christianity. The two emperors consulted on how they would carve up power between them, and one element in this decision was to extend toleration for Christianity throughout the whole empire. Licinius was not a Christian himself, although he agreed with Constantine to stop persecution throughout the empire. For now, such agreements come easily, but an alliance born of ambition is fragile, and Constantine must recognize that his sole co-emperor is also his greatest rival. After forming an alliance with Emperor Licinius, Constantine defeats the usurper Maxentius in Italy. Now convinced that the Christian God granted this victory, Constantine is determined to show his appreciation. For the first time in 10 years, Christians throughout the empire are able to worship freely. And for the first time ever, their faith is shared by the emperor. Constantine had converted to Christianity. He had embraced quite seriously the task of defending the Christian church. His family, including his son and heir, Crispus, converts as well. Constantine not only extended toleration to the Christian church, but in the territory he controlled, he favored Christians very thoroughly. In 313 AD, Constantine and Licinius jointly issue the Edict of Milan, recorded by the fourth century author, Lactantius. We grant both to Christians and to everyone freedom to follow whatever religion they want to. So whatever divinity there is in heaven may be appeased and made favorable to us and to all who are set under our power. But in the years that follow, Constantine's relationship with Licinius deteriorates. As Licinius battles his way to dominance in the East, his hunger for power grows. 
So Licinius goes off and does his own thing, as it were, uh, in the east, but Constantine doesn't trust him, and there are growing tensions between the two. After nine years of shared rule, both emperors covet control over the entire empire. It is a rivalry that will quickly drive Rome towards civil war. In the East, Christians soon bear the brunt of the growing conflict. As supporters of the Christian Emperor Constantine, they are now Licinius's greatest threat. They pay a heavy price. Ultimately, one of the responses was a renewal of persecution. And the reason for that, of course, was very simple. Constantine was known to be a defender of Christians, and Christian subjects of Licinius could look like a fifth column, could look like enemies in Licinius's own territories. So he chooses to persecute them. As the churches and holy books go up in flames, so does the old alliance between Licinius and Constantine. For Constantine, now a seasoned ruler of middle years, the persecution of Christians is just the excuse he needs to attack Licinius. He quickly orders his troops to march on his eastern rival. Constantine was an especially effective cavalry leader we often find himself at the head of cavalry, moving around the flanks of his enemy. He certainly does this to Licinius. At Constantine's side is his able son and heir, Crispus, who proves his worth in battle as well. Together they drive Licinius eastward. From Adrianople, Constantine and Crispus pursue Licinius to Byzantium and on to Chrysopolis where he makes his final stand. There in 324 AD, with the entire empire at stake, Constantine and Crispus face Licinius side by side. Crispus inherited his father's ability on the battlefield. Crispus was another military genius. Without Crispus's help, the success against Licinius may never have happened. Constantine and Crispus annihilate Licinius's army, fighting once more under the banner of the Christian God. The Battle of Chrysopolis was really over before it began. Constantine was able to bring his own troops into the territory of Licinius without any kind of effective resistance. His own army had been victorious now easily in several battles. Licinius's own confidence seems to have been minimal. And in the final battle, their victory wins Constantine's sole rulership of the entire empire. Eusebius, Bishop of Caesarea. The Eastern regions were united with those of the West, and the whole body of the Roman Empire was graced by a single and supreme ruler. Imprisoned in Nicomedia, Licinius will face a brutal punishment. The only witness is his beloved wife, the sister of Constantine. His relationship with Licinius is interesting. Licinius is technically, remember, his brother-in-law. Licinius' wife pleads for mercy for her husband. For a while, Constantine seems to grant that sort of clemency. They share a meal. Licinius is sent into exile. Then he's executed. Despite his wife's pleas, Licinius' execution is swift and bloody, making clear that Constantine shows no mercy even to members of his family. With the elimination of Licinius, Constantine now rules the entire unified empire and intends to make his loyal son Crispus a junior emperor in the West. As co-emperor, Crispus shares in his father's plans for a new Christian capital in the East to be located at Byzantium. 
after Constantine conquered the entire empire, he wanted to create a brand new city in his own name. And he did, Constantinople. He chose a strategic location halfway between the most important frontiers, and he deliberately chose to create a new city that would have no association with his pagan predecessors. It was a city that had no rival traditions. It was a Christian city. But even as his greatest dreams come to fruition, trouble brews among those closest to Constantine's heart, his wife Fausta and son Crispus. Crispus was the son of Constantine's first wife. His last three sons were the sons of his second wife, Fausta. And there can't help but have been some kind of tension between the two groups, especially on Fausta's side, because she would clearly want her sons to get what's coming to them, but of course Crispus is in the way. Jealous that Crispus has been granted power in the West, Fausta is determined to secure even greater power for her sons, no matter what the cost. With his son Crispus, Constantine defeats his last rival, Licinius, and finally unites the empire under his new Christian faith. But Constantine's unity is soon threatened as riots break out over religious differences within the Christian church. The situation he finds among Christians in the Eastern Empire is one of great turmoil. Uh, there's a controversy raging about the nature of Christ that is also tied up with the question of who ought to have authority in the Eastern Church. Rival bishops incite mob attacks against other Christians with opposing beliefs. It is a violence not seen since the days of persecution over 20 years earlier. Desperate for a resolution, Constantine demands the church officials put an end to the bloody controversy. So he calls together a council of over 300 bishops and has them meet at a city called Nicaea. He charges them with arriving at a single definition of what Christians believe. The result is the Nicene Creed, a statement of faith that has survived over 1,600 years and is still recited today in Christian churches around the world. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father. But it's a definition of Christian belief that not everyone can agree with. And this stores up a great deal of trouble for the future because it means that rival Christians, rival Christian beliefs, are constantly jockeying for imperial favor throughout the rest of the century. And it means that emperors are regularly distracted from other business of government by trying to manage the rivalries among different Christians and different Christian bishops. Perhaps it is this distraction that blinds Constantine to a rivalry much closer to his heart. In 326 AD, Constantine's wife, Fausta, attacks the integrity of his son, Crispus. Crispus was Constantine's eldest son from an early marriage, and uh, he did not have the same mother as, as his half-brothers had. And it's quite clear that he was in rivalry, strong rivalry, with his three younger half-brothers. As part of an elaborate plot, Fausta delivers shocking news, claiming that Crispus has tried to seduce her. Sarkiba! Things don't go very well for Crispus at all. Fausta was eager to get Crispus out of the way so her legitimate sons could succeed without threat from Crispus. Constantine, unable to see that it is his wife, not his son, who has betrayed him, orders Crispus to be prepared for execution.
Imprisoned in distant Pola, modern-day Croatia, Crispus insists on his innocence. Though his cries fall on deaf ears, he has an advocate in Constantine's court. Constantine received advice from his own mother, Helena, that perhaps it was Fausta herself who had engineered this little plot, had pretended to be violated or to have been uh, set upon by Crispus in order that she, Fausta, could promote the interests of her own sons. Constantine had certainly acted too hastily and was aware of that. Fausta pays for her treachery with her life. But Constantine's realization comes too late for Crispus. The prison guards have already received their orders to execute the royal son. What exactly happened, we don't know. But it was a terrible blow to the Roman Empire that Crispus was sacrificed on the altar of history. And Constantine is left only with a devastated conscience. As a sort of penance, Constantine spends the last years of his life building churches in Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Constantinople, and Rome. Among the most magnificent of these churches is one built on the site thought to be St. Peter's tomb in Rome, a place of pilgrimage for Christians to this day. It is for his churches that Constantine is better known. That in itself is an indication uh, both of his pro-Christian policies and of the attachment to the Christian faith. Refusing to abandon this faith despite its ongoing disputes, Constantine directs the construction of the glorious Basilica of St. Peter himself. It's an extraordinary explosion of architecture in a way that did not exist before in the Roman Empire. And the variety of plans could be explained both by the variety of architects that Constantine involved in this, and most likely by his own ideas. He was involved in almost every project there, and he was a man that actually had his own ideas about what's going on. Constantine can only hope that this devotion at the end of his life will erase a multitude of sins. For Constantine knows that his day of reckoning is not far off. Old and unwell, he finally requests baptism in 337 AD. It would make sense for Constantine to delay his baptism because emperors had a dangerous and dirty job. And sometimes they had to do difficult and sinful things as a consequence of their job. To delay baptism until the end of one's life made some sense. Those dangerous and dirty and sinful things that one had to do could be washed away before you die. Haunted by these sins, Constantine wants nothing more than to die with a clean conscience, purified by the waters of baptism. By the end of his life, Constantine is something of a sort of living visionary who, at the point when he's baptized, wanted to take off his imperial robes and live ever thereafter as a sort of priest. At the end of his life, Constantine finally finds peace in the faith he wrote about throughout his life. I know that I am in the true sense blessed, that now I have been shown worthy of immortal life, but now I have received divine light. Constantine dies in May of 337 AD after more than 30 years of rule. Constantine was tremendously successful as an emperor, tremendously successful as a military leader. This was a man who clawed his way into power using raw ambition. And at every turn, he used that same ambition in order to win the day. Throughout his life, Constantine fights to keep the fragile empire whole, unified under his new religion. But nothing, not even faith, can save it now.
Inheriting an empire ravaged by barbarians and torn apart by rival emperors, one man rises victorious. His name is Constantine. Fighting under the banner of a new god, he brings unity to a divided Roman Empire. Now, as its armies are defeated and emperors slain by barbarians, Rome is on the brink of disaster. In this chaos, two mighty leaders emerge, one from within the empire, the other from the ranks of its enemy. Their struggle will reveal an empire at war with itself. of the empire, Roman soldiers march off to defend the frontier villages from attack. A young boy named Stilicho proudly watches his father among them. Stilicho was the child of a mixed marriage, as it were. He had a, a Vandal father, but a Roman mother, and this meant um, that he grew up in a sort of context that was half barbarian and half Roman. This was not atypical of people in this period, and above all, the people who were associated with the army. Stilicho dreams of becoming a soldier like his barbarian father, fighting to protect the great empire. By this time, a, a sizable percentage of the officer corps was of what you might call barbarian ancestry. These are men who were recruited, worked their way up the ranks. The next generation, they become the generals. As ever fiercer tribes invade the empire, Rome's dependence on barbarian mercenaries grows by the day. Under pressure to protect its expansive frontiers, the empire divides in two. The west is defended by Emperor Valentinian in Rome, while Emperor Valens defends the east in Constantinople. But Valens is challenged in 378 AD when a savage enemy attacks the city of Adrianople. They are the Goths and what they want is Roman land. They intend to destroy the Roman forces with muscle, steel, and fire, knowing the heavily armored Romans will quickly feel the heat as the battlefield burns. The Goths were far more numerous, uh, and they had a lot to fight for. Uh, they'd been badly treated by the Romans, they'd been sold into slavery, they really had nothing to lose. During the Battle of Adrianople, Emperor Valens' soldiers are no match for the savage and relentless barbarian warriors. They attack, and everybody is pushed to the right. The Romans always edge to the right anyway, because you want to keep that right shoulder under the shield of the guy next to you. Now this is accelerated. Everybody compacts around the emperor, because he's on the far right, the point of honor, and his men won't move. So we have this acceleration this compactor process. The Goths come out of this circular deployment and surround the Romans and cut them down. The Emperor Valens himself falls on the battlefield, forced to fight for his life. It is a fight he quickly loses, sending his shocked soldiers into panicked retreat. When an ancient army breaks, mass slaughter always ensues. What made Adrianople even worse was that the Roman army was partly surrounded and not everybody could run, so that in their haste to get away, the um, Roman soldiers uh, ended up killing one another, trampling on one another, and suffocating to death, simply in the vast confusion. Two-thirds of the Roman army is lost. The late Roman historian, Armianus Marcellinus describes the carnage. Arrows whirling death from every side always found their mark with fatal effect since they could not be seen beforehand or guarded against. 
The Battle of Adrianople is a turning point in Roman history. It's a turning point from which the Empire cannot return. The army is largely gone, and there's no way of getting it back except to use the barbarians themselves. The new Eastern Emperor, Theodosius, does just that. He invites the Goths to a banquet, offering them land in exchange for military service. At his side is Stilicho, now a Roman general in his early 20s. Stilicho was half a barbarian, as it were. He was half Vandal, uh, half Roman. And as is typical for so many of these, these kinds of guys, he worked his way up through the army. Emperor Theodosius relies on Stilicho to handle negotiations with the Goths, whom he plans to use as mercenaries. The conditions that the Goths achieve from Theodosius are highly unusual because it puts them in a stronger position than, than they might have expected. The most important thing is that they're not broken up. The Goths who have been fighting Theodosius are all settled in one place. And they're settled in one place without being put under Roman control. Stilicho brokers the deal. In exchange for this land, the entire Gothic force agrees to fight his soldiers in Theodosius' army. Though Stilicho is himself a half-barbarian, Theodosius trusts him like a son and has no doubts. Stilicho he was very good at what he did. He distinguished himself. He came to the attention uh, of the emperor. And so as, as he worked his way through, he, he got higher and higher and was in command of a large contingent of Theodosius' army. But Stilicho's position does not make him next in line to rule. That honor falls on the emperor's biological sons, Arcadius and Honorius, who is born in Constantinople in 384 AD. Yet Stilicho enjoys a royal connection as well. Stilicho was actually closely related to the emperor Theodosius. Um, he had clearly been selected from among the many barbarian or semi-barbarian generals as a future leader, so much so that the emperor Theodosius had married Stilicho to his own niece, and this uh, marriage was a strong point in cementing Stilicho's relationship with the imperial house throughout the course of his, his life. Though chosen by the emperor to lead, Stilicho's power will always be limited. As a barbarian or a half-barbarian, there was no way he was going to be emperor, but that was it. Nonetheless, Emperor Theodosius knows he can rely on his most trusted general to help manage the Eastern Empire's biggest problem, the Goths. To solidify Emperor Theodosius's new treaty, Gothic boys are sent to training camps to be instructed in Roman military ways. What is clear is that they weren't fully Roman subjects, but that they were obliged to serve the Roman army when the Roman emperor called on them to do so. As Theodosius's right-hand man, Stilicho ensures the young Goths are well-trained and loyal. There is one whose natural talent catches Stilicho's attention, the boy Alaric. Alaric had probably been born inside the empire, and he'd probably been raised inside the empire with uh, full awareness of what a Roman military career was like. Taking Alaric under his wing, Stilicho cannot begin to imagine how their fates will be intertwined. Over the next decade, 
the Eastern Empire grows stronger under the combined rule of Stilicho and Emperor Theodosius. But their authority is jeopardized when a betrayal in Vienne Gaul rocks the Western Empire in 392 AD. While sleeping in his palace, the Western Emperor Valentinian II is murdered by his barbarian guardian, Arbogast, who then disguises the death as a suicide. The Emperor was the symbol of Rome's empire itself, and so the death of somebody who, around whom the state was structured, symbolically structured, is a tremendous psychological blow. Worse still, the Western Empire and its army fall under the control of the ambitious barbarian Arbogast. The usurper is now a threat to the Eastern Empire as well. Without delay, the Eastern Emperor Theodosius leads his army westward to confront the usurper. He calls upon his trusted general Stilicho to prepare the troops for battle. Stilicho was the master of the soldiers in Thrace and was in command of a large contingent of Theodosius's army at the time. Stilicho recruits the young Alaric, now a full-grown Gothic chieftain and his tribesmen to fight alongside the Romans. By now, about a quarter of the Roman army is made up of barbarian mercenaries. The Romans had become extremely reliant on non-Roman manpower with non-Roman leadership in a way that could potentially become very dangerous for the empire. Emperor Theodosius recognizes this danger, but he has devised a plan to destroy the usurper Arbogast and weaken the Goths in one powerful blow. In 394 AD, Theodosius leads his eastern army, including Alaric's Gothic troops, against the forces of the Western Roman Empire, now led by the power-hungry traitor Arbogast. The battle takes place in 394 AD at the River Frigidus in modern-day Slovenia. There, confronted with Arbogast's army, Emperor Theodosius orders Alaric and his Goths into battle first, preserving his Roman troops. He almost certainly deliberately put them on the front lines for the very first engagement, knowing that that was the most dangerous position for them. He probably hoped that as many of them would die as possible and yet still achieve victory. The Goths fight for their lives. But Arbogast's forces, hungry for blood and booty, cut them down. Just as defeat seems imminent, a fluke of the weather changes everything. It just so happened that the way that the troops were lined up, the winds were blowing very much against the forces of Arbogast and for the forces of Theodosius so that the projectiles that were shot and thrown on the part of Arbogast's army um, failed to reach or have any effect on Theodosius's army. With this advantage, Emperor Theodosius defeats Arbogast soundly. But in the process, he has made a dangerous new enemy. As Alaric searches the bodies of the fallen Goths for survivors, Theodosius's betrayal cuts deep. When the Goths were put on the front lines and used as cannon fodder or uh, missile fodder for the troops of Arbogast, uh, Alaric must have been furious. Never again will Alaric allow his people to be mere casualties of Roman glory. While Theodosius celebrates his victory at the Frigidus and becomes the sole emperor of Rome, 
Alaric and the Goths take their vengeance, ravaging the Balkans for food and booty. There, Roman farmers, unarmed and vulnerable, are completely unprepared for the wrath of the Goths. Their harvest is exactly what Alaric needs. Alaric has nothing now to draw upon to support his people. He does not have access to local taxes. He does not have access to granaries. That means he can't feed his people. Alaric is now determined to feed his people with Roman grain. And the local Roman garrison can do little to stop him. Emboldened by their success, the Goths now declare Alaric their king. With Alaric, they become the first barbarian people to create a kingdom inside the empire. Alaric is very important because what he does is really forge the Goths as a single political unit and really create from a, a, a band of soldiers a people. Alaric's Gothic kingdom is unchallenged for now, as the empire faces other, more critical upheavals. In 395 AD, when Emperor Theodosius falls ill and dies, the empire is divided once again. His teenage son Arcadius is made emperor of the East in Constantinople, and his 10-year-old son Honorius becomes emperor of the West in Rome. Theodosius' loyal general Stilicho is not forgotten. He becomes the boy emperor Honorius' protector and teacher. After Theodosius fell ill, it was Stilicho that he turned to for whatever reason. He says to, to Stilicho, according to one version or the other, that he wants him to be uh, the regent of Honorius. Inexperienced in the tools of war, young Honorius relies on Stilicho for his expertise and guidance. Stilicho had a sort of patronizing relationship, a sort of godfather relationship with this child. I think Stilicho always saw Honorius as his little kid. But Honorius is an indifferent student. Stilicho keeps a keen eye on him. He knows that the future of the Empire depends on his control of the boy. In 397 AD, Stilicho secures his hold on Honorius by marrying the young Emperor to his daughter. What he was really interested in is having his grandson be emperor because he married his first daughter, Maria, to Honorius. So clearly he wanted Honorius's son and his grandson to be emperor. So that would be the only possible way that he could have direct familial influence over the, uh, the, the, next, the next emperor. The wedding guests are scandalized at the joining of the royal bloodlines with a barbarian but Stilicho is oblivious to their anger, seeing himself as Roman to the core. But Stilicho's power in Rome does not extend to the other young emperor, Arcadius in Constantinople. There, the 19-year-old Arcadius enjoys the amusements of the imperial bedchamber leaving important matters of state to his advisors. Well, the fact that uh, Theodosius, had he been alive to see his sons uh, try to operate without his presence, would have been greatly disappointed. Of that, there can be no doubt. Shockingly, Arcadius grants the honor of consulship to his chief of staff, the eunuch, 
Eutropius. A eunuch as a consul is like uh, having a, a porn star elected as president of the United States. This is just so far beyond the pale that people just can't believe it. A eunuch as consul is, is monstrous. But what makes him truly hated in Constantinople are Eutropius's plans to negotiate with the barbarian Goths. For three long years, Alaric and the Goths have raided the Balkans, pressuring Emperor Arcadius in Constantinople to give him the land that his people so badly need. Finally, in 397 AD, Emperor Arcadius invites Alaric to Constantinople at the urging of Eutropius. Indifferent to politics, the emperor leaves the negotiations to the eunuch. Eutropius executed an agreement between the Eastern Court and Alaric. And Alaric, this Gothic leader, certainly saw in that a tremendous advantage, particularly the advantage of being able to gain supplies and potentially land from the Eastern Court. In return, Alaric promises the Goths will once again fight for the Eastern Empire. But this deal leaves the people outraged. The Goths uh, had regularly confronted the Romans in battle and actually defeated the Romans in battle. Um, the Romans, therefore, had a, a huge amount of um, not so uh, um, carefully disguised distaste for the Goths. Poisoned with hatred for their one-time enemies, the angry people will not be satisfied until the streets of Constantinople flow with Gothic blood. In 397 AD, the Eastern Emperor Arcadius, at the urging of his closest advisor, the eunuch Eutropius, makes a treaty with Alaric the Goth. But anti-barbarian prejudice spreads like poison throughout the city. After two years of public outcry, Eutropius is finally arrested swept away in the growing race hatred. His rivals claim his disgrace will quickly appease the angry mob. The problem that arose, of course, was that his power made him unpopular, and he had a great many rivals in for control of, of the imperial court. And one of the things they exploited was his um, willingness to negotiate with barbarians and with the Goths. Eutropius is sent into exile and later executed. But his sacrifice does not quell the anti-barbarian fervor of the people who rise up and massacre every last Goth in the city. It's very difficult in any period to put your finger on the roots of ethnic tension. It's clear enough that the Romans resented barbarians who were invading their territory. But Roman feelings against barbarians went much deeper than that. There was a sort of visceral dislike of anything that smacked of barbarism. Such violence against his people sends an undeniable message to Alaric that a treaty with the East is impossible. The hatred is too deep. A desperate Alaric takes his people west to Italy, hoping to gain a favorable treaty from General Stilicho instead. But soon, a terrible new force threatens both the Goths and Rome, the Huns. Sweeping into the tribal villages at the margins of the empire, the Huns attack and destroy everything before them. Well, the Huns were moving west, 
they were looking for greener pastures, as it were, and they're forcing the various Germanic tribes, the nomadic tribes, the settled tribes to move out of their way. The Huns are nasty, they're ruthless, and no one wants to be near them, but to all intents and purposes, they're forcing the others ahead of them like a bow wave uh, in front of a boat, and people are, are trying to get out of the way. Those who do not flee the savage horsemen are cut down with brutal precision. For the Huns leave no survivors. The Hunnic invasion forces other barbarian tribes deeper into Roman territory. And while Emperor Honorius moves the seat of the Western Empire to the better protected city of Ravenna, the defenseless villages of Northern Italy fall prey to the barbarians' devastation. the dwindling Roman forces are overwhelmed. In the Italian field hospitals, General Stilicho watches the numbers of fallen soldiers grow daily, depleting an already sparse army. And I think that's one of the main problems that Stilicho faces. He just doesn't have a proper standing army. And it then becomes the major problem of the West. Throughout the fifth century, there isn't a standing army. Something happens, you gotta run around, pay guys, gather sort of whatever mercenaries and whatnot you can, and get off to the battlefield as quickly as you can. With each soldier he loses, Stilicho grows more desperate. In order to defend Italy, he needed more troops. And in order to take back the rest of the empire, he needed more troops. And he needed them because much of the Western Empire wasn't under his control. Being half barbarian himself, Stilicho feels his support in the army is waning. Now he has no choice but to turn to the one person who can help him secure more troops the Gothic king, Alaric. In 406 AD, Stilicho travels to Alaric's camp in Illyricum, modern-day Serbia, offering a deal. Alaric, eager for a treaty with Rome, welcomes Stilicho to his camp. Stilicho brings his old friend Alaric a gift to warm the Goth to his request. Stilicho desperately needed troops. There simply weren't enough Roman troops in Italy to go around. And the only reservoir of manpower was Alaric and his Goths. Stilicho also offers Alaric the position he's always wanted. In 404, he wants Alaric to be given a Roman command, and he's given a Roman command so that, so that Stilicho can then use him as an army to capture Illyricum, so that he can then use that as a launching pad. Stilicho desperately needs Illyricum, a recruiting ground for soldiers that now belongs to the Eastern Empire. Alaric agrees to help him take it for the West, offering Stilicho a Gothic sword as a symbol of their treaty. From Alaric's point of view, this was a very good thing. He needed some way to keep his followers occupied so that they didn't simply drift away. He needed some way to keep them fed so that they didn't mutiny or, or, or depose him. Stilicho promises Alaric that his Goths will be well paid by the grateful Western Emperor Honorius. The two men embrace his allies once more. But years go by, and Honorius's court is unwilling to make good on Stilicho's promise to Alaric. Stilicho finds he has lost influence over the young emperor. By now, Honorius is a full adult, doesn't need a guardian anymore. Stilicho's position versus Honorius's court, the inner circle, that is a very difficult one. Because as Honorius grew into adulthood, his court distances him, Honorius, from Stilicho's influence. Feeding the emperor anti-barbarian propaganda, 
These advisors have delayed Stilicho's plan to work with the Goths for years. The Goths now demand to be paid for their service as promised. Stilicho needs to come to the Roman Senate and he needs to ask that the senators themselves produce 4,000 pounds of gold in order to pay off the Goths for this. He has to do so in many ways over the protests of Honorius, so it's very clear that the two of them are beginning to part ways at this point. But Stilicho warns Honorius that if Alaric is not paid, the Goths will revolt, an event the emperor may not survive. Honorius at first agrees to this, but then his personnel official, uh, who's named Olympias, believes that uh, Stilicho is trying to do this so that Stilicho himself can set up his son, Eucarius, on the Eastern throne. Scared and confused, Honorius believes Olympias' claims, making a decision that will spell disaster for both Stilicho and the Western Empire. Facing barbarian invasions on the frontier, the Roman general Stilicho appeals to Alaric, king of the Goths, for troops. But Emperor Honorius' advisor, the anti-barbarian Olympias, turns the emperor against Stilicho. Olympias and his like-minded officers incite the army to revolt against the half-barbarian general Stilicho. And so Olympias then starts sowing all sorts of rumors amongst the troops as well. The troops riot in August and they call for the death of Stilicho. Swayed by Olympias' slander, Emperor Honorius responds by issuing a decree against Stilicho. Honorius had many courtiers willing to play upon his fears, to suggest to him that Stilicho was seeking the throne for himself or for his son, and the emperor's mind was really poisoned against Stilicho. Stilicho is himself declared a public enemy, and many of his supporters are massacred in cities throughout Italy. Ethnic hatred explodes among the populace. Fifth century chronicler Orosius. Stilicho was sprung from the barbarian Vandals, that cowardly, greedy, treacherous, and crafty race. The racially motivated violence is brutal, and the victims are quickly overwhelmed. Determined to cleanse the empire of all barbarians, the Romans now hunt for the general himself. The angry mob of Roman soldiers, eager for blood, finds Stilicho in a church in Ravenna where he has taken refuge. Stilicho flees to a church and tries to escape the decree, knowing full well it will mean his death, but he's given strong assurances that he's only to be arrested and not to be executed. Despite his misgivings, Stilicho decides to give himself up willingly. He was in a position to, to seize the state for himself, had he wanted to. But he remained a loyal servant of the ruling family his whole life. Even at the end, when he was betrayed by the master he had served his whole life, he refused to, uh, to rise up and, and resist. And it certainly spared Italy a civil war. Outside the church, among the angry mob, Stilicho finds Olympias waiting for him. Instantly, a second decree arrives, ordering Stilicho's death. His attendants and bodyguards threaten that they will attack uh, those who have been sent to arrest Stilicho, but Stilicho, um, in very noble fashion, agrees to allow himself to be killed so as not to stir up further trouble. Stilicho is stripped of the symbols that mark him as a Roman general. 
Stilicho himself is something of a tragic figure. He could quite easily have rebelled when he faced this hostility from his emperor. But instead, he surrendered, left the church where he had taken sanctuary, and went quietly to execution. The great barbarian general is felled as those he sought to protect cheer on. His death excites the crowd, who are no longer satisfied by symbolic gestures. Their hatred of the Goths soon spreads beyond Ravenna to cities throughout Italy. Roman troops attacked any Gothic families immediately killing as many as 10,000 of them as a response to this anti-barbarian sentiment that had arisen at the end of Stilicho's administration. Sixth century historian Zosimus describes the massacre that occurs in the Italian cities in 408 AD. The soldiers fell upon the barbarian women and children in each city, and as if at a predetermined signal, destroyed them and plundered their property. Naturally, those Goths who remained alive and who escaped this massacre uh, were no longer willing to associate themselves with the Romans, and they had an easy and quick place to turn, Alaric's army. 30,000 Goths instantly switched allegiance and joined Alaric. But with Stilicho's death, their treaty with Rome and the money and land it promised them vanish. Alaric and his now powerful army move towards Rome to pressure Emperor Honorius to give them what they want. Alaric and his tribesmen invade Italy and lay siege to Rome in 410 AD. But Emperor Honorius, safe in Ravenna, refuses to negotiate with the Goths. Honorius and his advisor Olympius care little for the people of Rome. So what little by little happens is Alaric's trying to do anything to get Honorius's government to sit across the table from him and talk shop. I mean, we're talking, what's going on here? We're destroying Italy. All I want's a command, some place to take that command, and the court won't talk to him. But the Roman senators insist that Alaric's demands must be met or the city will fall. They're negotiating a ransom, in essence, for their city. And what they agree to pay seems like a lot. It's many thousands of pounds of gold. Humoring the senators, Honorius agrees, sending Alaric word of a possible treaty. Come to Ravenna and we'll come to terms. But the anti-barbarian emperor has his own plans for the Goths. In the chaos following General Stilicho's death, the Goths lay siege to Rome. To save the city, Emperor Honorius agrees to make a deal with the barbarian's king, Alaric. Alaric and his troops begin their journey from Rome to Ravenna to meet Honorius for negotiations in good faith. But along the way, Alaric is ambushed by a group of mercenaries working for the emperor. The fact is that over and over again, the Romans display that they're only barely going to tolerate these barbarians and that whenever possible, they're going to massacre them or put them in harm's way so that they'll be killed. As his men are cut down around him, Alaric knows he has been deceived by the Roman Empire once again. That's a good story of betrayal, of a lack of honor on the part of the court of Honorius. Alaric is a very honorable man who's dishonored by both courts. Uh, and one could go on. Alaric is done with peaceful negotiations. 
he orders his men back to Rome, bent on destruction. The Goths break through the gates of Rome in 410 AD and at long last enter the ancient Roman capital. For the first time in 800 years, the great city is sacked. It's important to realize that Alaric didn't want to sack Rome, and he did not want his army to sack the city. It was a decision made out of frustration at the fact that really two years' worth of negotiation had failed to get him anything that he wanted. And in the end, um, he saw, saw no other way forward but to allow his army to sack Rome. Unlike the Romans, who so recently slaughtered thousands of Goth women and children, Alaric orders his soldiers to show restraint. Alaric clearly did his best to stop his troops from indiscriminately killing people or seizing captives. Nonetheless, for three days, the Goths plunder the riches of Rome, taking all they can carry. The sack of Rome would have been devastating in terms of the amount of treasure and money that was taken away from the city. And we can be sure that however mild it was, there were still a great many atrocities perpetrated. There's no question of that. But the deepest effect of the sack of Rome is psychological. A former citizen of Rome, St. Jerome, writes mournfully about the devastated city. My voice sticks in my throat, and as I dictate, sobs choke my speech. The city which had conquered the whole world was itself conquered. In response to this attack on the very heart of the empire, Emperor Honorius does nothing. It becomes clear that Stilicho's death has robbed the empire of its last great leader. Honorius is, in a sense, a captive a courtier figurehead, alone in his palace, surrounded by courtiers, with no real sense of the, the, what's going on in the world or anything else, for that matter. When confronted by refugees from Rome come to beg for aid, the emperor shows only annoyance, ordering this reminder of his failure to be removed. So not only is he distancing himself from the realities of government, he's progressively losing the credibility of the office. Many Romans lose faith in the emperor's ability to defend its people from their barbarian enemies. Their fears will be justified. As the Goths continue to savage the dwindling Roman army, the emperor is powerless to stop them. The Goths are here to stay. The Gothic kingdom that grows out of Alaric's following is the first real successor to Rome in the West. It's the first part of Roman territory to fall away, um, and it's the first of many. Over the next 40 years, barbarian tribes will continue to pour across the vulnerable borders of the empire, taking large regions of Roman land. These losses and the fading of the empire were foreseen by General Stilicho who tried desperately to stop them, only to earn his own execution. Stilicho's tragic downfall foreshadows the terrible and irreversible fate of the empire itself. In 
the late 4th century, endless barbarian attacks poisoned the empire with suspicion and hatred for its own immigrant soldiers. The half-barbarian, half-Roman general Stilicho is not the last to be sacrificed, a bloody death foreshadowing the fate of an empire on the brink of collapse. Now, in the 5th century, over 500 years after the death of Julius Caesar, the Roman Empire is ravaged by war and is quickly losing land to its foreign invaders. In the midst of this chaos, three Roman generals compete for the power of emperor. But through treachery, betrayal, and murder, only one, the barbarian-born Ricimer, gains control of Rome. He is the puppet master. In 455 AD, the ancient city of Rome, once a pinnacle of civilization, is sacked by a violent tribe of Vandal barbarians. The Vandals have come from North Africa to the capital of the Roman world, uh, as it used to be anyway. Uh, the Romans are shocked and terrified uh, that barbarians could come to their ancient cultural center and literally take anything that they wanted. After centuries of endless barbarian attacks, Rome has lost control of the Mediterranean. Desperate, the empire offers up its last and greatest treasure, the land itself. In exchange for peace, Rome grants its fertile soil to the barbarian tribes. The problem is that they had no choice. And so the Romans just negotiated with them and said, okay, you're here, we can't get you out, we'll give you this territory. And Romans just gave it away. The empire has been officially divided between east and west for over 75 years. But while the east remains strong, the West has lost most of its territory to the barbarians. As it barters away its land, the empire receives barbarian soldiers in return, but the plan only backfires. The emperors made a deal with the devil, so to speak, because when the emperors gave land to the barbarians, they were giving away whatever tax revenues might come to the imperial treasury from those lands. The more you gave away, the poorer you got. The poorer you got as Roman emperor, the more land you needed to give away. And it was a deadly downward spiral for the strength of the Roman Empire. The empire has always depended on foreign mercenaries. Yet in the 5th century, the Roman army is almost entirely of barbarian descent. The former enemies are now peers. Barbarians, once the slaves of Romans, are now often their superiors. All these men are saying, hey, my parents may have been a barbarian, but I'm not. I'm a general in the Roman army. And they're competing for the honor attached to leadership. Age-old ethnic tensions divide the army, pitting soldier against soldier, Roman against barbarian. But in 456 AD, one ambitious general is determined to maintain order, though he himself is a barbarian. His name is Ricimer. Ricimer's career followed a path that was, was quite normal for barbarian nobles. He was from a minor branch of the Gothic royal family. Uh, he had no real prospect of winning power in his home society, and so he sought service as an officer in the Roman army, where he did very well for himself. Now, Ricimer devises a plan to gain even more power in the Western Empire. He will lead his army against Rome's greatest foe, the Vandals. The problem is, to all intents and purposes, there is no such thing as the Roman army at this time. A commander, whoever he happens to be, sees a threat, then has to raise the army however he can, if he has money, 
then move that army to the location and fight. Rissimer marches to Agrigentum in modern-day Sicily to confront the Vandal forces sailing from their stronghold of Carthage. In Sicily, the Vandal warriors come down hard on Rissimer and his army. The Vandals know their enemy, and they know the terrain. Sicily and southern Italy were like the Vandals' ATM. Every spring, they'd get in their ships and row over and make a very violent withdrawal and then go home. <laughs> and the Roman security cameras couldn't do anything about it. Rissimer leads his troops against the great onslaught of barbarians. Yet despite his own military training, his army of mercenary soldiers is at a disadvantage. The Roman army by the middle of the fifth century is no longer the army that it had been a hundred years before. For one thing, it's considerably smaller. Uh, for another, it's less well armed and it's certainly less disciplined. Consequently, there just doesn't seem to be any, uh, there's no evidence that there's any kind of training or tactics or whatever. It's simply this great whack of Germans is then sent off against that great whack of Germans and they just keep killing one another until either it gets dark or somebody gives up or somebody runs away or you know, whatever, the, whatever the case may be. Though the skill and discipline of Roman formation has been lost for decades, the Vandals are unable to break Rissimer's men. The Roman army claims victory, not for the empire, but for their great leader. The battle-weary Rissimer returns home a hero, but he's not the only general seeking his fame and fortune in Rome. Two old friends from his youth are equally ambitious. Majorian and Agidius. Rissimer, Majorian, and, and Agidius had all effectively been fellow junior officers, and their careers had marched in step with one, and with one another over the years. But now it is their innate differences that stir conflict below the surface. The three men reflect the great ethnic divide hindering the empire. I think one of the sources of the obvious personal tension between Agidius, Rissimer, and Majorian really lies in their origins. Agidius is from Gaul, Majorian is from Italy, and Rissimer is a barbarian who wants to live as a Roman. And Rissimer is out to prove that he has as much right to a piece of the empire as any other Roman. But the competition for absolute power in Rome is not limited to Rissimer, Majorian, and Agidius. They must now swear allegiance to a new emperor, Avidus, whose tenuous claim to the throne rests only on his formidable barbarian entourage. It's quite clear that Avidus' regime rested on a foundation of Gothic military support and that the Gothic king was Avitus's most influential and in some ways um, absolutely indispensable backer. With his Gothic bodyguards, Avitus is untouchable. Rissimer and his friends can do nothing but take their orders and wait while the old figurehead enjoys the luxury of power, neglecting the true problems of the empire. In North Africa, Rome's grain supply has been seized by the barbarian vandals. North Africa was the breadbasket of the empire, producing grain, the staple of most people's diets, and olive oil, equally important for the fat in people's diets and for a million other uses. Without the precious grain, famine grips what's left of the empire's provinces. In Rome, the poor must steal what they can to survive. Gone are the security and comfort of Rome's heyday, replaced now by despair and turmoil. 
So everything is topsy-turvy. Uh, there's no stability, there's, there's no sort of knowledge of what's going to happen in the future. Everything uh, is uncertain. The situation at the Imperial Palace soon declines as well. Angry and impatient, Emperor Avedis's Visigoth soldiers demand payment for their services. Avedis is desperate. Roman emperors couldn't pay the barbarian troops that they needed in cash because the Roman Empire's revenues were so greatly decreased. So when Roman emperors were bartering for military support, they were dealing in the only good currency they had left. So Avitus has to strip the bronze off of the temples in order to pay the guys who came down to Gaul with him, all the, the, Gothic, the Gothic army and, and his Gothic entourage. But by selling the treasures of Rome, Avitus only saves himself. He leaves Italy in the poorhouse. Hungry and hopeless, the Romans riot in the streets, demanding that Avitus banish his Gothic troops from Rome. Avitus is not popular, and he's not popular with the Italian army, and he's not popular with the Italian general, Rissima. In the public's outrage, Rissima and Majorian see an opportunity. Vitus was in a desperate situation, and when the barbarian Roman commander uh, Rissimer decided that Avitus was a losing proposition, uh, Avitus had no uh, choice except to flee. The emperor may flee the chaos of the crowd, but escaping the ambitions of Rissimer will prove to be more difficult. In the fifth century, Rome is overrun by barbarians. Three old friends, the generals Rissimer, Majorian, and Aegidius, maneuver to attain absolute power in what's left of the Western Empire. But first, they must subdue its incompetent emperor, Avitus. Chased out of Rome, Avitus flees over the Alps and westward into his native Gaul, where he gathers Visigothic supporters before returning to Italy. With the support of his fellow Gauls, Avitus hopes to easily regain the throne. But back on Italian soil, Rissimer and Majorian are waiting for him. The ambush is brutal. These battles are up close and personal because you have to be able to kill them from up that close. Uh, so there's pushing, there's shoving, there's running back. There are dead bodies to climb over. There are injured men yelling. In the bloodbath, the army of Avitus is annihilated. But in a surprising turn, Rissimer spares the emperor's life on the battlefield. Avitus is made bishop in a church in the same Italian city where he is defeated. Why was Avitus, the deposed emperor, made into a bishop? So that he would no longer have any military connections or any military power, and so that Rissimer, who deposed him, could say, I didn't slaughter a legitimate Roman emperor. I allowed him to follow a religious vocation which he had always wanted to do. This is the public story. But in the shadows, Rissimer sends a secret assassin, his old friend Majorian, to silence Avitus for good. For Rissimer, holy exile isn't enough. He must have total victory. Italian Romans wanted to protect what they saw as their own interests. With the deposition and then strangulation of Avitus, the emperor from Gaul was out of the picture. And now Romans in Italy could hope that they would go back to the future and that Italy, the source of Rome's original greatness, would once again 
be the source of the Roman Empire's salvation. With the Emperor Avitus finally gone, Italy celebrates. But the mastermind behind Avitus' death has no plans of proclaiming himself as a replacement. Ricimer himself will have realized that he could never survive as emperor. It would have been unacceptable for a barbarian of a uh, barbarian warlord uh, with indeed royal connections to barbarian royal houses to assume the Roman throne. No barbarian leader really contemplated it seriously. Instead, Ricimer names a man he thinks he can control, his best friend. Majorian, the man whom Rissimer decided to make emperor instead of himself, was an Italian. Rissimer had gauged the sense of especially the Roman upper class in Italy. The Roman upper class in Italy wanted an Italian emperor. Rissimer decided he'd be the power behind the throne and make Majorian, that good Italian, into the Roman emperor. Like the Wizard of Oz, however, Behind the curtain, Rissimer was going to pull the strings, or so Rissimer thought. With the new regime, the three old friends enjoy the spoils of power. Rissimer is named Master of Soldiers in Italy, and Agidius is sent on assignment to his native Gaul. Agidius is reasonably successful. We have a number of sources that say very positive things about him, both as a commander as and an individual. So he, he seems to have been he seems to have been a very charismatic um, and uh, successful military commander. Agidius secures his army's camp in Gaul near the city of Soissons, but with the Franks to the north, the Visigoths to the west, and the Burgundians to the east he is trapped in a sea of barbarians. Under constant attack from their barbarian enemies, Agidius and his army rise to the occasion, determined to defend Roman Gaul at all costs. Agidius uh, was a Roman from Gaul, from France, uh, who had extensive military and diplomatic experience. Um, and the Roman hope was that he could prevent further, especially Gothic, uh, incursions in Gaul and protect what admittedly small part of Gaul was still part of the Roman Empire. The endless barbarian assaults take their toll on his already diminished forces but Agidius refuses to admit defeat. At this stage, Egidius in the 450s, there's still hope, perhaps, and he clings on to this view and uh, tries and hopes for a restoration of Roman power. With Agidius in Gaul, Rissimer expects to wield full power in Italy, but Majorian has other plans. What Rissima discovers is that Majorian has uh, every intention of being an active um, Roman emperor rather than the figurehead that he was intended to be. He tried very hard to push Rissima into the shadows and into the sidelines, uh, and he tried to take command of major military ventures on his own. Majorian uh, is an emperor who's clearly very dynamic, who is also very efficient, and he's also aware of the deficiencies of the empire, which he's determined to rectify. Majorian devises a grand campaign against the Vandal King Geyseric, leaving Rissimer on the sidelines. This Rissimer will not allow. The alliance between Rissimer, Majorian, and Agidius yields success when Majorian is made emperor, and Agidius gains victories in Gaul. But Rissimer's power as the mastermind is threatened when Majorian strikes out on his own, launching an expedition against Rome's greatest enemy, the Vandals. 
Majorian leads his troops across the Alps into Gaul and south into Hispania to prepare a naval attack against the Vandals of North Africa. Majorian commissions carpenters to build the strongest, fastest ships, hoping to overpower the great fleet of the Vandal King Geyseric. Majorian wanted to drive the Vandals from North Africa to restore the Roman Empire's most important source of food and revenue. Camped near the Mediterranean coast, Majorian takes every precaution for his important and expensive mission. Majorian is, by all the evidence we have, careful. He sends scouting forces across the uh, Straits of Gibraltar, tests the waters, if you will, of uh, local support for a landing, because it's going to be a landing operation. This is not exactly D-Day, but it's going to be, by lay Roman standards, a very significant naval action here. But in the night, disaster strikes, despite all of Majorian's efforts. Geyseric's men set the Roman fleet ablaze. Once again, the Vandals proved to be too much for the Romans. They cannot defeat the Vandals. A lot, lots of things, they just collapse uh, before, they even, <laughs> before they even really start in some cases. The expedition really collapsed uh, halfway through and, and the, the Romans up to that point were winning. If Majorian had been able to conquer Africa, it's quite clear that he would have been unchallengeable. But as it was, the mission was a disaster. The invasion was a disaster. The fleet that had been collected to carry the soldiers across the Mediterranean was burned in the harbor where it was being uh, mustered. Majorian returns to Italy, dejected, his great plan to recapture North Africa ruined. This is a humiliating act in part of Majorian. The way Roman concepts of power and honor worked, this emperor, the last one who really had the capacity to lead men into battle and thereby achieve the the image of manliness is humiliated. Along the same wooded road to Rome, a troop of soldiers rides to intercept the emperor. It is the honor guard of Majorian's old friend, Ricimer. Majorian was the first military emperor that Rome had had in years and years and years. But with the failure of the Vandal expedition, Ricimer, for some reason or other, decided to get rid of him. There may have been other things going on. Majorian may have blamed the failure on Ricimer. Ricimer may have blamed the failure on Majorian. We have no idea. Fifth century writer John of Antioch. Ricimer and his soldiers arrested him stripped him of his purple robe and crown, beat him, and beheaded him. Thus ended Majorian's life. A messenger carrying news of Majorian's murder makes his way slowly to the far-off Roman outpost of Soissons, Gaul, where Agidius is stationed. It is very bad news for the general. The only response um, that Agidius is likely to have had is that he and Majorian and Ricimer were buddies. They had served together for decades. What does this make him? I mean, his, his legitimacy was his appointment by Majorian, who has now been discredited and killed. I think his future is very uncertain. With Majorian dead, Egidius no longer sees any point in continuing to cooperate with Ricimer. And so Egidius simply breaks away. He refuses to recognize Ricimer and Ricimer's new government. 
and effectively rules his bit of Gaul as an independent kingdom. Agidius must prepare his soldiers. Declaring independence from Rissimer is akin to declaring war. Rejecting Rissimer's rule in Italy, Agidius considers his kingdom of Soissons the last vestige of the Roman Empire. There's no evidence that they're responding to orders from Bricamir or anyone else in Italy. They're on their own. They're, they're, they're completely independent. So the fabric of the empire is now broken down into pieces. In Rome, Rissimer prepares for war as well. But first, he must find a new emperor to do his bidding. This time, there is no dispute. The man he chooses is no more than a puppet, Libius Severus. No one wants to be emperor. It's not a job that anyone needs. The only person who needs an emperor is the generalissimo. He's the guy who needs the emperor. Nobody else needs one. So Ricimer's there and he needs an emperor. So he's the one who appoints the successor to Majorian, Libya Severus. With the new emperor Severus by his side, Ricimer can do as he pleases and nothing will please him more than getting rid of Agidius once and for all. In the fifth century, Emperor Majorian and his two old friends, Ricimer and Agidius, share power in Rome. But when Ricimer has Majorian brutally murdered and appoints a new puppet as emperor, Agidius has no choice but to remain in his native Gaul and prepare for war. After such a personal betrayal, Agidius and his men are ready to do battle with Rissimer. The power alliance between the three old friends has been hijacked, and Agidius is left out in the cold. Maybe he thought he had an understanding that he was a co-player in this game, that there were two generals in charge here, Rickamir and Agidius. Gideus found out that he wasn't, he wasn't regarded as a player. He wasn't consulted, and he lost the third part of the triangle. Now he's on his own. But Rissimer is already making plans to block Gideus's impending attack. With the new emperor, Severus, under his thumb, Rissimer makes a deal with Rome's one-time enemy, the Goths. Rissimer saw this as a really serious threat, Agidius's proposed invasion of Italy. So Rissimer did the smart thing. He made an alliance with the Goths who were in Agidius's rear, Goths, Agidius, Italy, because Rissimer knew if the Goths could put pressure on Agidius from the back, Agidius couldn't come to Italy, uh, and that's in fact what happened. Just as he has always done, Rissimer commissions someone else to do his dirty work. Emperor Severus proves to be the perfect puppet for Rissimer, happy to allow the war against Agidius to unfold. As Agidius moves his troops south from his kingdom in Soissons, Gaul, he is attacked by Rissimer's army of Goths outside the city of Orléans. These battles begin with both sides roaring each other like at the kickoff of a football game. There was an actual word for it. It starts out with a low growl, and then all the soldiers eventually are just yelling at the top of their lungs. Then you throw missiles at the other side. With such a powerful barbarian enemy, Agidius and his troops are hard pressed to gain the advantage on the battlefield. The barbarians uh, were especially good at running at full speed and using throwing axes, which were very sharp with a heavy head and 
either shattering the shield of the men opposing them, or if you were really lucky, hitting them with the ax. But while the Goths are soldiers for hire, Aegidius fights for the survival of Rome. Finally, he claims victory, but the losses are great. In the field hospitals of Gaul, Aegidius and his men recover from the Gothic attack, but he knows there will be more. One dance, Chief. Aegidius has his hands full, essentially. These uh, deals that Ricimer cuts with uh, kingdoms in his vicinity obviously mean that he has to deal with these. These are going to be his priority. He's going to be busy in Gaul and not be able to detach any forces to invade Italy. He, he just simply doesn't have the resources to deal with it. Desperate to vanquish Ricimer's forces in Rome, he turns to an unlikely source for help. Aegidius sends a messenger south to Rome's most menacing enemy, Geyseric, who, as king of the Vandals, had taken North Africa, the breadbasket of the empire, over 20 years earlier. He sends an envoy to try to strike a deal, and Aegidius must have been very worried about how this deal would be perceived if it got out to be public knowledge. Um, on the one hand, people could see, well, if we can reach a real deal with the Vandals, then we have a real bright future. But on the other hand, what will we have to give up to deal with these people who've taken away the most precious, the richest part of our empire? After traveling through Gaul and Hispania, Aegidius' envoy finally reaches North Africa. In the Vandal camp, the messenger delivers Aegidius' plea. It looks as though Aegidius may have sought to establish some sort of relations with Geyseric in North Africa from the point of view that they both have a common enemy, that is, Ricimer in Italy. And therefore, Ricimer could be caught between Gaul and North Africa, a potentially very dangerous position for Ricimer. The barbarian king Geyseric could be the last best hope for the empire's survival. Surrounded by barbarians in Gaul, Aegidius is unable to drive his army against Ricimer and the puppet emperor Severus. With nowhere else to turn, Aegidius sends a plea for aid to the Vandal king Geyseric. In Soissons, Thousands of miles away from the Vandal Kingdom in North Africa, Aegidius can only wait for a reply. We don't know for sure, but I think it's likely that Aegidius' envoy reached uh, the Vandals and that perhaps a deal was in the making. Um, we really can't say. Aegidius has run out of time. Assassin sent by Ricimer makes certain he will never fulfill his dreams of a restored empire. It seemed this mission serious enough uh, and perhaps that it was it seemed possible that it was going to succeed, which uh, led the Gideus' enemies to finally find a way to undo him by treachery because they couldn't take him in direct battle on the field of combat. With Aegidius out of the way, Ricimer's hunger for power only increases, and his thirst for blood cuts short the life of his puppet emperor, Severus. Ricimer makes and unmakes, through violence, a series of emperors trying to find that front man who would allow Ricimer to really be the power without developing ambitions of his own. The problem for Ricimer was that when he put a puppet on the Roman throne, that puppet didn't want to remain a puppet. But now total power is his. Rissimer's ambition and bloodlust seem to know no limits. 
For two years, Rissimer rules Rome without naming an emperor. And the barbarian vandals continue to ravage Italy. Any alliance they might have had with the murdered Agidius is now as dead as the general himself. As Rissimer sits on his impotent throne, they take the empire away, piece by piece. When the Western Empire starts to disintegrate, it disintegrates very rapidly. In a sense, the Roman Empire doesn't actually fall. It simply splinters away until the title of emperor becomes meaningless. Rissimer's continued failure against the Vandals only makes matters worse. As the Vandals strike against the Eastern Empire's coastline, its capital of Constantinople is finally forced to move against Rissimer before it's too late. From within his protected palace walls, the Eastern Emperor, Leo, devises a plan to save the troubled Western Empire from Rissimer and the barbarian invaders. But it's at this point that Leo realizes that he has to stop the Vandals, and so what he does is he sends Anthemius. Now, Anthemius was the son-in-law of previous Eastern Emperor, and he actually had a better claim to the throne than Leo did. So Leo's kind of killing two birds with one stone here. He gets rid of a potential opponent, as it were, and he provides an emperor for the West, a competent emperor for the West. And Leo has plans for Anthemius' family as well. He sends them all from their home in Constantinople westward to Rissimer's palace in Rome. Anthemius' young daughter, Olympia, is offered to Rissimer in marriage in an attempt to subdue the ambitions of the bloodstained general, while Anthemius assumes the throne of the Western Empire. It seems as though uh, the Western government had uh, nothing against this, and Ricima, who was, as it were, the effective ruler of Italy, welcomed him there and married his daughter, called Olympia. So it looks as though everything was set for a good beginning and things might have gone very well. Rissimer's assumption that Anthemius will serve simply as another puppet emperor soon proves false. The real problem was Anthemius. Anthemius was sent by the East. Anthemius was acting like an emperor, and it wasn't always, uh, he wasn't always doing what uh, Ricimer wanted. In 468 AD, with Anthemius now maintaining control in the west, the Eastern Emperor Leo finances a large-scale expedition against the Vandals in Sicily. There is no example of the east helping the west militarily uh, unless their own interests were involved, and almost always it involved the Vandals, because the Vandals had this giant port, they had a fleet, and of course this is, what, this is what prompted the big expedition in 468, because they were now actually able to attack uh, the east anywhere. But Rissimer cannot tolerate Anthemius, who, backed by the Eastern Empire, diminishes his own hold on power. The tradition in the West by this point was that the emperors were merely figureheads, that Rikima uh, made the important decisions, made emperors and removed them and conducted military operations himself, whereas Anthemius was perfectly capable of doing this himself. Filled with jealousy, Rissimer sabotages the attack, assassinating Rome's own commanders, leaving the empire's forces vulnerable whole thing falls apart and then the unfortunately the uh, fleet which is headed by uh, Leo's brother-in-law it falls apart as well the ships are burned everything is a complete disaster after the Empire's crushing defeat in Sicily Rissimer spends months gathering troops in Milan before launching a full-scale attack on Anthemius in Rome So 
So Ricimer brings in the army and they besiege Anthemius in Rome for nine months until eventually Rome falls. And meanwhile, while the siege is going on, Leo has had envoys sent to him from the West saying, all hell is breaking loose, it's civil war, do something. But there's no time to save Rome from Ricimer's wrath and all Anthemius can do is flee. In a familiar scene, the deposed Anthemius seeks sanctuary in a church. Well, we know that the, the, uh, the besiegers broke into Rome uh, early in July of 472, and that Anthemius's followers scattered. Anthemius disguised himself as a beggar and was caught probably at the shrine of the martyr Chrysogonus. But this time, Ricimer hires no assassin to silence his emperor. On the steps of the Christian altar, he personally sees to the sacrifice of his latest victim, Anthemius. he was executed. I assume it was cutting his head off. That's the normal way it's done. Uh, chances are they probably stuck his head on a pike and paraded it around. Rissimer plays true to form. Once again, with blood and steel, he carves out his place in Rome, leaving only corpses in his wake, bodies as lifeless as the empire itself. Again without an emperor, Rome succumbs to anarchy and violence. Barbarians meet little resistance as they raid the towns of Italy. They go out and they sort of rape, loot, and plunder, uh, attack cities and whatever else, and then come back. And this is what people have to face uh, every year. So it, it's, it's, there's no stability. Rissimer does nothing as the empire self-destructs. He cares only for himself, as always, garnering his power from the empire's weakness. So now there's a peculiar circumstance here. We don't seem to need a real emperor, and it's hard to find a role that's clearly cut out for the commanding officer of the Western armies. One could really question why we have any imperial government at all. This society is slipping out of the structural system that we had identified with the Roman Empire. Rissimer is a man who has built his career and power on the countless dead bodies of his enemies, both barbarian and Roman. Now he is alone, master of an empire in name only. In such turbulent times, even the details of Rissimer's death are fragmented. Priscus, the only source, tells us that he died vomiting copious quantities of blood. Haima pleiston, and that's it. And so we have no idea whether it was you know, an ulcer or cancer or what. With the sources, we have no idea. When the puppet master dies, the Western Empire dies with him. By now, barbarian leaders, whether they were Goths or something else, really had the money and the men to decide the fate of the Roman Empire. And that is exactly what happened in the years after the death of Rissimer. Rissimer's struggle to dominate brought nothing but ruin to the empire he hoped to control. Yet in his absence, its future grows even more bleak. Ethnic tensions continue to divide the already ravaged empire. As the barbarian-born general Rissimer claws his way to the throne, hungry for power, he kills anyone who stands in his way, including his closest friends. Now, 
Roman control of the empire's once great western provinces is swept away by a storm of barbarian warlords and kings. Out of the chaos, one Roman leader rises up, determined to restore Rome to its glory days. But in his path stands a fierce barbarian warrior prince. For the empire, the clash of their swords is the beginning of the end. By the 5th century AD, after hundreds of years of constant warfare, the Western Roman Empire is a mere shadow of its former self. The empire was into full-blown crisis. There was increasing pressure from barbarians outside the empire who wanted to come into the empire. And above all, there was the tremendous financial pressure. The empire wasn't generating the revenues that allowed it to keep its military force strong and its infrastructure repaired. Without a well-armed military, Rome is powerless against one of the largest barbarian forces the empire has ever seen, the Huns, led by their ferocious leader, Attila. 5th century chronicler Callinicus recounts their savagery. The barbarian Huns became so great that more than a hundred cities were captured, and there were so many murders and bloodlettings that the dead could not be counted. The Huns, a nomadic tribe from the east, lay waste to what little is left of the empire. The fact is, is that there is no state in the West. The West has dissolved. The West has fallen apart. There are so many different entities, so many different armies, so many different powers that are vying for control that there's no control. Though the eastern capital of Constantinople is able to survive the Hunnic invasions, the weaker Western Empire feels the brunt of their expansion and is forced to cede the Roman region of Pannonia to Attila the Hun. In the empire's former territories, Romans must now answer to their barbarian rulers, the Huns. Romans and barbarians can identify each other by the way they speak, by the way they dress, by the way they smell, by the way they wear their hair. Even though by this time Romans and barbarians are really used to each other, I think it's fair to say that ethnic tensions have never gone away. But one Roman moves through the troubled society with ease and finds opportunity in Attila's new regime. His name is Flavius Orestes. Orestes was a Roman who'd grown up in territory dominated by the Huns, but he got a high position at the court of Attila. The empire may be falling down around him, but it's his Roman heritage that makes Orestes and the other Pannonians valuable to Attila. They're Roman because they talk like Romans, they walk like Romans, and there is still the cultural, the social, everything that makes up what a person is and does is still Roman, and that goes on for centuries. Able to read and write, the cultured Orestes stands out among Attila's many barbarian allies. Orestes is soon made secretary in the ruler's court. Orestes got to see how Attila had a real political vision trying to merge the Huns with the Romans through marriage and political alliance to come up with a new empire there in the north. Having daily contact with Attila the Hun, Orestes experiences firsthand just how brutal barbarian justice can be his Roman sensibilities are easily offended. I think it is fair to say that there's what we would call ethnic tension between barbarians and Romans. They faced a problem similar to the problem that we face today. These different peoples from different cultures need to work together in important ways. They want to become like each other, but there's tension between them. 
Though Orestes is repulsed by the barbarians' blood sacrifice of their enemies, in Attila's power, Orestes finds the ambition for something more. Orestes, when he served in the court of Attila, was able to see how this leader was organizing a nation out of nothing. And I think Orestes, above all, would have learned that there was a real possibility of seeing a new kind of Roman world one led by a king that melded barbarian and Roman strengths to restore the glory of Rome the way it had been at the time of the founders, the kings. Orestes may be ruled by barbarians, but he will always be Roman and always think of himself and his people as superior. He longs to return the once great empire to its Roman roots. In 453 AD, Attila's reign comes to an unexpected end on his wedding night, soon bringing about the collapse of the mighty Huns and their barbarian allies. His bride finds him dead of a broken blood vessel and terrified of being accused of killing him, spends the entire night next to the corpse. Sixth century historian Giordanes. He fell, not by wound or by foe nor by treachery, but happy in his joy and without pain. But the Hun's demise cannot save Rome. The power vacuum that results only allows more barbarians to descend upon the fading Western Empire. In the following years, Rome's cities fall into disrepair. Hunger prevails and beggars fill the streets. Orestes wanders no longer a man of influence. He seeks his fortune in a land struggling to survive. The infrastructure seems to have crumbled in some cases fairly quickly. It varied from one region to another. Aqueducts, it's true, sort of perhaps fall into disrepair, and the quality of pottery perhaps in some places diminishes. It's all getting a bit more hectic. The street plans begin to change. The regular features break down. It is a time of diminished hope and starving children. The details of Orestes' travels are lost to us, but as a true Roman, he refuses to believe that the empire is beyond saving, that the humanity and civilization at its core cannot be brought back. He sets his sights on one day making his way to the city of Rome. The fact is, is that Rome fell physically far earlier than it fell psychologically. The idea that Rome could fall was difficult for many to accept, and many didn't accept it. They believed as long as there was an emperor on the throne, there was a Rome. As long as there were walls around the city, there was a Rome. As long as there was somebody who believed a Rome existed, the empire in fact existed. In the mid-fifth century, after years of constant pressure from barbarian attacks, Rome is forced into a treaty with a powerful tribe called the Burgundians, granting them valuable Roman land in exchange for military service. Originally from Scandinavia, like many Germanic barbarians, the Burgundians are allowed to settle in southern Gaul. These territories on the periphery of Italy are the first to go. It's just very slowly, little bits and pieces are given away. In a way, it's kind of like if you think about your body, if you're out in the cold, your body is programmed to make sure that your brain and your sort of heart and whatever survive no matter what. So your fingers go first, your toes, your feet, your hands, and it's very much like the Roman Empire. In return for these land grants, the Burgundians must supply the empire with mercenary soldiers. But this treaty only furthers Rome's plight. When they give land to the barbarians, since land is a great source, perhaps the principal source of revenue, the more land they give away, the less money they have coming in. The less money they have coming in, the more land they have to give away in order to keep uh, barbarian support to keep the army strong. So it really is a vicious spiral that leads more and more to a financial crisis. The Burgundians' leader, Gundabad, is the son of a mighty chieftain. But as the empire grows weaker and more desperate for his tribe's many mercenaries, he is a powerful force in Rome as well. In 
In the Empire's capital, Gundabad is made the master of soldiers, but he controls more than the army. He also chooses Rome's emperor, Glycerius. It's a choice made by Gundabad, because Gundabad thought that he was a loyal figure. But it's clear that Glycerius must rule at the pleasure of Gundabad, and he must rely upon the support of Gundabad to do this effectively. The emperor's great throne room is filled with more barbarians than Romans. The Western Roman army at this point is overwhelmingly barbarian, if not entirely. It seems likely that there were still native Roman forces in there. But when we do hear of this army, it's an army that contains Turks and Germans and a range of other non-Romans. In charge of Glycerius's barbarian mercenaries is a barbarian warrior named Odovacher. Odovacher found a position in the Imperial Guard close to the center of power, surely because he had a demonstrated military competence and real leadership ability. This is the Rome that Orestes encounters when he finally arrives after decades of travel. Upon first meeting Odovacher, he cannot know how deeply the empire has changed since its glory days. The power of the Western Empire is certainly gone in the 470s, but I think it's probably not clear to everybody that this is a doomed enterprise. It does seem potentially to be just a momentary weakness, and had the course of things gone differently, perhaps it could have recovered. Orestes' diplomatic experience earns him a high position in the Imperial Army, but he is surprised to find Odovacher, a lowly barbarian, holding equal standing. They obviously were both highly ambitious. They had survived really tough circumstances. Orestes had succeeded at the court of the bloodthirsty Attila the Hun. Odovacher had been a military commander and had brought himself literally later from rags to riches at Rome. I think their ambitions as well as their special competences would have put them on the track to compete with each other. Both have their own visions of empire, one Roman and one barbarian. After spending years in the court of Attila the Hun, the Roman Orestes is made a general in the Roman army. But in Italy, he encounters an empire that's disintegrating and hardly Roman. Its power resides not in its emperor, Glycerius, but in the barbarian generals, Odovacher and the Burgundian chieftain, Gundabad. In the past, Rome had integrated its barbarian mercenaries in the army to ensure that they never gained too much power. But what happens in the fifth century is that they stay as Germanic groups. They get to keep their own clothing, their own food, their own culture, their own administrative structure, their political structure, their military structure. And it's bizarre, but they aren't Romanized. And now, Gundabad's warriors hold the same rank as their Roman peers and Emperor Glycerius's Roman army. The army at Glycerius's disposal, or rather, basically that Gundabad has at his disposal will be a mixed formation, no doubt comprising some Burgundians, but many other various groups as well, that together form, as it were, the army in Italy. In the case of the Roman army, there seems to have definitely been tensions at times between barbarians who were serving and Romans who were serving, Romans who felt that because it was the Roman army that their leadership capabilities should be recognized, whereas barbarians should be disqualified because they were barbarians. The once unified power of the Roman military is lost as violence explodes within its ranks, dividing the army against itself. General Orestes, once so skilled at diplomacy, soon finds that even he is powerless against it. As Rome suffers greater losses against tribes like the Visigoths in Gaul, Roman soldiers must question the allegiance of their barbarian allies. 
like everybody had their own interests at this point. Things become somewhat fragmented and diffuse. So that what we're dealing with is a group of people whose interests are no longer united, even among the Romans themselves. Chaos reigns on the battlefield when the army no longer fights for the empire, but every man for himself. When the enfeebled Western Empire can no longer keep its enemies from sacking the Mediterranean coastline, the stronger Eastern Empire, based in Constantinople, finally steps in. In the Imperial Palace, the aging Eastern Emperor Leo enjoys the security of his heavily fortified capital. The reality of the Roman Empire in the mid 5th century was that there was a distinct East and West. The reality was also that the East was prosperous, the West was not. Blaming Glycerius for Rome's failures, Leo hopes to extend his own reach by appointing a new Western Emperor, Julius Nepos. The thinking about why Nepos was chosen to go to the West revolves around the position that Nepos had at court. He was a very well-placed person, related by marriage to the Emperor Leo. He was a figure who was suitable for leading an invasion to Italy. In 474 AD, Nepos assembles an army and leads his troops away from Constantinople, bound for Italy. The East is going to look to reassert its influence in the West uh, and find a candidate who could depose Glycerius. Its reaction is not a surprising one. As a newly appointed emperor, Nepos has a great deal to prove and even more to lose if he fails in bringing the Western Empire back from the barbarians. As Nepos's army sails from Constantinople, the Western Emperor Glycerius must prepare his own army to counter the attack in Rome. But when Glycerius orders Orestes and Odovacar to ready their troops for battle, he encounters firsthand the problem of barbarian loyalty. Gundabad and his Burgundian troops desert him in his hour of need. What happens is that Gundabad abandons his position to go back and become king of the Burgundians, which is clearly a, a, a lot more fun than being the generalissimo of Glycerius. The army, because it's not a Roman army in terms of its native background, has a different agenda and a different set of, of desires than perhaps a citizen militia would. Without his Burgundian support, even the armies of Odovacar and Orestes cannot save Glycerius from the invading forces of Nepos. As Nepos draws near Rome, Glycerius and his commanders ride out, not for battle, but to plead for mercy. And so Glycerius found himself in a situation where he really couldn't expect military support either from hired barbarians or from his local troops. So when the Eastern Empire sent Nepos to take over, Glycerius made the only rational decision. He surrendered without a fight. Nepos, having come to Italy to violently unseat Glycerius, now spares the emperor's life. Nepos wanted the appearance of legitimacy, that he would become emperor with the backing of the Eastern Emperor and the approval and agreement of the Western Emperor who would step down because he recognized that Nepos was the better man for the job. He orders Glycerius be made a bishop and sends him into exile far from Rome. In June 474 AD, when Nepos is crowned Western Emperor, he is lauded by Orestes and Odovacar. Being equally ambitious, both men transfer their loyalty to their new leader immediately. Orestes, being Roman, also has an idea that there is still a Rome. 
and he can still protect Rome. In the case of Odovacar, there seems to be a recognition that there is no more Rome. And so how it plays out is you've got two very capable men at the very moment in time when a decision is made whether Rome will cease to exist. Nepos promotes the Roman Orestes and the barbarian Odovacar to the highest posts in his court, giving them unmatched power in Rome. Elevating Orestes and Odovacar at the same time, giving them kind of equal power, at least equal recognition, he's kind of prepared his own demise. In both of these characters, he's elevated individuals who are of strong will and of great capabilities. But the court politics in Rome are quickly overshadowed by relentless Visigoth invasions against the last remaining Western Roman territory of Gaul. At the height of the Roman Empire, this region, now known as Provence, France, was a prosperous community. But throughout the 470s, its people are subject to constant raids from the Visigoth barbarians and their king, Euric. The very ambitious Visigothic king, who was a real expansionist, decided that he was going to attack this area there in southern France that wasn't under his control. By this time, the Visigoths really did have an overwhelming force. And so it was simply part of the process by which Roman territory in Gaul was constantly shrinking until it was reduced to just a tiny slice along the coast of what is today southern France. The bloodthirsty Visigoth warriors lay waste to the villages of Provence, showing no mercy to the helpless Roman citizens. The Eastern Emperor Leo sends Julius Nepos to Rome as the new Western Emperor. Nepos is counting on his two commanders, the barbarian Odovacar and the Roman Orestes. But even with their support, the Roman Empire is in terrible jeopardy. Barbarian Visigoths invade southern Gaul, forcing the meager Roman legion stationed on the border into battle. The Imperial soldiers, underarmed and unprepared, are no match for the Visigoths. The Goths seem better organized. Their kingship seems to be stronger. They seem to be able to mobilize more forces. And the forces seem to be better able to deal with whatever eventualities occur in warfare. The fighting is brutal. The carnage overwhelming. Something must be done. Though the Roman commander Orestes is inexperienced in battle, Emperor Nepos sends him from Rome to Gaul with orders to drive the barbarians out. He's to be the new commander-in-chief in Gaul. Now, the thing is, you can ask yourself, is this such a great honor or such a great position to be given, given that there's very little? that's left to be controlled in Gaul. It seems like an honor, but perhaps it was actually a way of sidelining him. We don't know. But in his camp on the Italian border, the former diplomat, Orestes, tries his hand at military strategy, hoping to sideline Odovacar and the new emperor, Nipas, instead. He offers a deal to his mostly barbarian soldiers. If they march with him against Emperor Nepos, he will grant them valuable land in Italy. We know that Orestes turned against Nepos, that instead of following the emperor's instructions, he decided to try to seize power for himself. Why did Orestes turn against Nepos? I think Orestes had a vision of restoring Rome. Abandoning Gaul to the Visigoths, Orestes leads his army from their camp in northern Italy back towards Rome. But when Emperor Nepos learns of the invasion, he flees to Ravenna. In August of 475 AD, Orestes marches into Ravenna and orders his troops to scour the city in search of the emperor. 
the barbarian soldiers go on a rampage, terrorizing the citizens and destroying property. I can only imagine the Orestes either thought that Nepos was selling out the Roman Empire to the barbarians, or the Orestes simply had this overwhelming ambition to capture the Roman Empire's leadership for himself. But even under the threat of death, no one reveals the emperor's hiding place. Emperor Nepos is forced to secretly escape the city, according to 6th century historian Jordanes. Nepos fled to Dalmatia, and, deprived of his power, he languished there as a private citizen, in the same city where the exiled emperor Glycerius recently became bishop. Soon, Nepos is on his way out. He's exiled and will continue to be exiled, calling himself emperor until 480. And in fact, some historians give him sympathy as the last Roman emperor, but he's long since ceased to exist as an emperor. With Nepos gone and the barbarian soldiers under his thumb, Orestes believes he can restore order to an empire engulfed in anarchy. In a surprising turn, Orestes does not take the throne himself, but instead names his young son Romulus Augustulus emperor. Orestes decided that he, with his childhood having grown up among barbarians and his service at the Hunnic court, that maybe the Italian elite wouldn't want him, Orestes, as the emperor, but they would accept this pure Italian Romulus as their leader because it would appeal to their sense of tradition, no matter how empty in terms of power that feeling was now. The boy will remain in the well-protected city of Ravenna. He was protected by Paulus, his uncle. Romulus is still an adolescent and had not yet come to full maturity, hence his name Augustulus, or Little Augustus. Young Romulus is merely a puppet for his father. It is Orestes who will rule the empire, finally edging out his rival, Odovacar, to become the most powerful man in Rome. Swollen with pride, Orestes ignores his debt to the barbarian soldiers. But after holding up their end of the deal, helping Orestes unseat Nepos, they demand their payment of land. These guys want to get settled on Italy, on Italian territory, on the land of Italian senators. And Orestes is enough of a Roman to know that this isn't going to fly. And so he says no. Orestes couldn't pay the soldiers. For the soldiers, the purpose of having an emperor was to pay them. And so when Orestes, the power behind the throne with the sun on it, can't come up with the money that they want or can't come up with the land that they demand, then there's only one answer. Get rid of that emperor and get somebody else who can get us what we want. With the help of his guards, Orestes is able to flee the chaos but he underestimates the power of the barbarian army, now bent on revenge. After years of competing for power with his barbarian co-commander, Odovacar, the Roman Orestes gains the advantage, crowning his own 12-year-old son as puppet emperor. But tensions rise as the barbarian army goes unpaid. When the barbarian soldiers are denied what Orestes has promised them, settlement land in Italy, they turn to his greatest rival for help, Odovacar. So the soldiers made a perfectly rational decision to go to somebody else, in this case Odovacar, who they thought had a better chance of satisfying their demand. Odovacar was a barbarian and they could expect that he wouldn't have nearly as many qualms about giving them land or money or whatever they needed, regardless of where it came from, in order to make them happy. The soldiers make Odovacar an offer he can't refuse. So they turn to him and they say, well, if you can get us this land, 
we'll make you king. How does that sound? Oh, that sounds all right. So off they go, and he seems to be the leader of the sort of ragtag bag of Germanic peoples in this supposedly Roman army. Together, they set out to bring down all Roman power in the empire. Odovacar will now taste the revenge he seeks against Orestes, who dared to usurp his power in Rome. They immediately begin to raid the cities of Italy. The narration that we have of this talks about days and days of plundering. Uh, the wealthy being stripped of all of their money. After risking their lives for the sake of an empire they can't even call their own, the barbarian soldiers feel the time has come for Rome to pay in blood what they cannot pay in money and land. Pretend you're a soldier for them. Pretend that you have to live on the meager wages that you've got, and now you'd miss a payday. One payday, you may be able to make it. Two, three, four paydays in a row, you're starving. Are you going to have much allegiance to the army that has left you starve? Now answering to no one, Odovacar relishes the opportunity to finally assert his dominance over Italy and Orestes. What we're talking about in 476 is not a war per se. There's no great battles, there's no sieges. You've got starving soldiers seeking to survive. And in order to survive, they will do whatever it takes to do so. Because they are trained to fight, they will put down anyone who encounters them. And riots and rampages and sackings and rapings take place. With Odovacar closing in, Orestes leaves his son, the young emperor Romulus, in Ravenna under the care of the boy's uncle Paulus, while Orestes escapes to Ticinium in northern Italy. Orestes is forced to seek refuge from Odoacar and his troops in Ticinium, which is modern Pavia. We're told by a text that the bishop of Pavia gives Orestes sanctuary in the city. But even the house of God cannot protect him from the barbarian forces. Orestes is forced to flee as Odovacar and his men ravage the church, desperate to root him out. The bishop had his collection of alms stolen. All of the money he collected to help the poor was stolen by Odovacar's forces. They also burned buildings, including the church. As the church goes up in flames, so do Orestes' visions of the empire's rebirth. Odovacar does not care about the perpetuation of Rome. In fact, it's a realization to him very early on that Rome no longer exists. But what role does he play? What power can he hold? Orestes and his guards escape to Kinium hoping to buy enough time to prepare for the certain face-off with Odovacar. Once they were peers in the emperor's court, now they are locked in a struggle for their very survival. Both are very proud of the position they hold, and neither are willing to recognize the other has any power at all. Now, in that case, of course, a clash is imminent. Orestes and his army get as far as Placentia, modern-day Piacenza, Italy, before they are finally confronted by Odovacar on the battlefield. The inexperienced Orestes has little chance against the savagery of Odovacar's barbarian troops. It would have been loud, chaotic, bloody, violent, dusty, which is why morale, even more than training, when push came to shove, was at the heart of who was going to win and who was going to lose. There are dead bodies to climb over. There are injured men yelling. There are people loosing their bowels from fear.
there was something still symbolic about the empire, as if the last few gasps of imperial power could be hung on to by someone who felt that the empire could be restored by them. They thought the empire was still existent or that they could save the empire. We know as historians now that they cannot. No matter how foolish, Orestes refuses to admit defeat. When the Roman general Orestes breaks his promise of land to his barbarian troops, they launch a full-scale revolt led by Orestes' rival, the barbarian general Odovacar. Now fighting on a battlefield near Placentia, Italy, the two adversaries vie for supremacy, just as they once did in the emperor's throne room in Rome. Odovacar and Orestes are the two most important individuals in the West. On their shoulders lie the future of Rome, and one has to agree with the other. There has to be some compromise made. If not, there will be violence, and that's in fact what happens. It's a brutal fight to the death, and in the battle's end, just as in the empires, the Roman finally succumbs to the mightier barbarian. We don't know exactly what happened when Odovacar caught up with Orestes, uh, but my suspicion is that it was a quick and brutal end. Um, there was not going to be any elaborate ceremony. There was not going to be any elaborate funeral. Orestes was to disappear. I'm sure his execution was swift, silent, and total. Victorious. Odovacar and his troops marched to Ravenna to address the only unfinished business left, the young son of Orestes, the last Western Roman emperor. The 12-year-old emperor, Romulus Augustulus, and his uncle Paulus are unaware of Orestes' death and unprepared for the murderous assault of Odovacar's men. When Odoacar comes to Ravenna, Romulus is not able to put up much of a fight. But Paulus, who is charged with protecting Romulus, manages to do this and, and tries to protect his nephew. Odoacar's forces then kill Paulus and move against the boy emperor, Romulus Augustulus. Terrified, the boy flees the sounds of his uncle's murder. The last Roman emperor, trapped like a bewildered animal, cannot hide from the barbarian's blade. There is no escape. Romulus is a mere figurehead, and so there's no reason, in essence, for Odoacar to do anything to him. But the ruthless warrior makes a surprising choice. He spares the boy's life, sending him into exile. By saving his life, Odoacar can show his clemency and can show to the Romans that he can behave in the way that a just sovereign ought to behave. In the summer of 476 AD, Odovacar becomes Italy's first barbarian ruler. Odovacar is now king. Now, he's not king of Italy, he's not king of the Roman Empire, he's just king of these guys. This little motley band, whatever it was, making up the Roman army at this point. Odovacar is king, not emperor, because the Roman Empire is officially dead, just over 500 years after its birth in 27 BC. It really is the end of a Roman emperor in the West. Now there's going to be a king in the West. There's still a Roman emperor in the East, but the East has no effective control over the West. In a real political sense, things have changed fundamentally. News of Rome's fall travels quickly to the new Eastern Emperor Zeno in Constantinople. The messengers arrive bearing the news the Eastern Empire has dreaded for years. They carry the last vestige of the boy emperor's imperial office. 
The last thing that Odoacar has Romulus Augustulus do before he formally steps down from the Roman throne is send an envoy on behalf of the Senate and the Emperor conveying the ornaments of imperial authority to Constantinople with the word that no emperor is needed in the West. With a barbarian king lording over Italy, the remaining symbols of Roman power are no longer needed. We know that Odovacar very publicly proclaimed he was not going to wear the purple robes and the golden crown that signified a Roman emperor at the time. He was going to leave those aside. Odovacar was something new. He was a king in the West, not an emperor. The robes and the crowns and the jewels of emperorship now belonged to the Eastern Emperor. But in his hands, they no longer signify power and prestige, only failure and loss. Back in Italy, the families of the barbarian soldiers are now finally granted the land they fought for. The West now lies completely in their hands. It's clear Odoacar did uphold what he had agreed to his soldiers. He kept his promise, he gave them what was due to them, and was a man of his word to those supporting him. For the empire, invasions of women, children, and homesteads proved more powerful than those of warriors and siege machines. Rome became strong in the beginning because it took in outsiders. That is to say, it encouraged immigration. But in the end, when the barbarians came in numbers and wanted to be part of the Roman Empire, uh, for complicated reasons, the Romans were unable to take them in in the way that they had done before. This failure to make immigration a positive source of strength really was one of the principal reasons for the undoing of the Roman Empire. But despite the fall of the empire, in remote places like monasteries and libraries, the great knowledge and ingenuity born of Roman civilization is miraculously salvaged and saved. The idea of Rome endured because in those pockets where there was still an emphasis on learning and education and books, it was Romanness and the classics of Roman literature and culture that were seen as the foundation of a civilized life. The Roman Empire has bequeathed a huge amount to us, certainly in the West. So many institutions, so much terminology, the very languages that we speak that are so marked by Roman influence, it's all around us. We simply cannot escape the Roman legacy, however hard we may try, and that's why it matters. From democracy to empire to its fall, Rome has inspired the Western world as we know it. Its civilization survived centuries of war, persecution, corruption, and plague, only to die quietly, slowly, at the hands of one barbarian soldier. There is a romanticism to caring about the fall of Rome, caring about the Roman Empire as a whole. I mean, it certainly was a very important part of the formation of the modern world. Well, let's face it, it has been around for 1,500 years. Why should we care any longer? Now, I think the answer is very simple on that. We should care because in Rome lay all of the wonderful aspects of humanity and all of the terrible aspects of humanity. And if we study those, we understand them. Perhaps we can repeat the good ones and not repeat the bad.